the social ties unraveled, intrigues, alliances, and transformations, part 3. Josh found himself momentarily speechless. While everyone else rejoiced when Zachary was absent from the office, Josh was the exception. He wished for early departures too, allowing him to spend more time with Jasmine. However, he was genuinely happy for Zachary, knowing that the storm between him and Serenity had finally subsided. Are you available in two days? Serenity inquired of Zachary. Zachary's gaze was fixed on her, his eyes intent. What's the matter? Let me know if you need anything at all. I'm always here for you. Since you don't have work over the weekend, why don't you come with me to my hometown? I'm arranging for bricks and gravel, one truckload each, to be delivered to my parents' house. We'll have the trucks unloaded in front of their home to send a message that my sister and I are returning to renovate the house. Before Zachary could react, Serenity added, Nana mentioned that my granddad and relatives have been keeping an eye on them. They have no shame and no boundaries. Perhaps they believe we pose no threat, now that they lost their businesses and jobs. We're starting with my parents' house. Liberty and I have discussed reclaiming our property after the new year. By spreading the word, I'm certain that my granddad and the others will hastily return. Serenity was strategic in her thinking. The hunts had crossed the line too many times. To divert their attention, she had chosen her parents' house as the starting point. She aimed to draw their focus away from her while also addressing the house issue through legal means. Zachary's dark eyes sparkled with approval. He believed Serenity's plan would work perfectly, effectively addressing the house situation and shifting the hunt's attention elsewhere. Alright, I'll join you in your hometown this weekend. It's been a while since you visited your parents' grave. I'd be honored to accompany you and your sister. This year, I can also pay a visit to your parents' resting place alongside you. The Hunts had chosen to relocate the graves of Zachary's parents-in-law to an undisclosed location. The Hunts' ulterior motive was to prevent the sisters from visiting the graves, all while coercing John into paying homage to Serenity's parents as if he were their own son. This scheme aimed to position John favorably for inheriting the property left by Serenity's parents. The mention of her parents weighed heavily on Serenity's mood. In a comforting gesture, Zachary took her hands in his and reassured, your parents above would undoubtedly be delighted to witness your prosperity and your sisters in life. Determinedly, Serenity proclaimed, I'll reclaim everything that rightfully belongs to my parents. You can count on me. We'll take back what's rightfully yours. I'll engage the finest legal minds to fight this case. We won't let them prevail, Zachary declared with resolve. Serenity affirmed his sentiment with a resolute nod. Her determination was unwavering. Ahem. Elise's throat clearing abruptly interrupted the couple's moment. Drawing nearer, she addressed the couple as they looked on. Saren, my mom called and asked if you could come home with me. We should start preparing for the event, Elisa conveyed. Turning to Zachary, she added, Saren has prepared an early dinner for you. It's ready now. Would you like to have it here? Zachary glanced at Serenity, a silent plea in his eyes, hoping she'd stay. Serenity was well acquainted with Zachary's preferences. His appetite was heartier when she was by his side. After all, she took care of him by cooking his three meals each day to aid his recovery. We usually don't consume much during events like this. It's wise to have a light meal before heading out, Elisa uses the event as an excuse. She efficiently set the table and wiped it clean. You're planning to visit your hometown this weekend, Saren. Would you mind if my mom and I join you? I'm curious to see where Aunt Lisa used to live. I believe my mom would appreciate the experience too. 
She's been wanting to explore your hometown and meet Aunt Lisa's adoptive parents. Following Aunt Lisa's passing, her adoptive parents had withdrawn a portion of the insurance money and severed ties with Serenity and Liberty. While they seemed to be distancing themselves, it didn't change the fact that they had raised Aunt Lisa. Mrs. Stone was eager to learn more about her sister's upbringing, and the only way to access those details was through her sister's adoptive parents and she's grateful for the care they provided. Of course, I don't mind at all. And Audrey also expressed her desire to visit my hometown with me and pay respects at my mom's grave. However, circumstances have been quite busy since the new year, delaying our plans, Serenity explained. Her priority shifted when she discovered the truth about Zachary shortly after the new year. The turmoil between them had caused concern among their acquaintances, delaying their hometown visit. Elisa chimed in, I overheard your conversation with Zachary. Addressing the property issue promptly is indeed essential. Remember, you can always rely on us if you need any assistance. Don't worry. If I need help with anything, I won't hesitate to ask, Serenity assured. Elisa responded with a scoff, that's what you always say, yet you never include me in anything. Elisa's memory harked back to the time Serenity led a group to confront Hank at his home. While Jasmine had asked if Elisa should join, Serenity had neglected to involve her. Elisa couldn't help but feel left out of the exhilarating event. Serenity's laughter resonated as she enveloped Elisa in a warm hug. With a soothing gesture, she reassured, No need to be upset, Elisa. I promise you won't miss out on the next enjoyable moment. Elisa teasingly pushed Serenity away, quipping, Don't hold me hostage. Your man is giving me a stern look. Elisa's comment made Serenity's gaze shift to Zachary. Responding in a measured tone, he articulated, While she's a woman, I still find it concerning that you're hugging her. If you want to embrace someone, choose me. Serenity planted a peck on his cheek and playfully pinched it. Okay, I'll reserve my cuddles exclusively for you. Now go wash your hands. I need to head to my aunt's place once you're well fed. Zachary whined facetiously, adopting a tone of mock dissatisfaction. I've got nothing else to do, yet you won't let me tag along. We haven't attended an event together since we got married. Serenity leveled a knowing look at him and queried, and whose fault is that? Zachary's retort faltered as he promptly fell silent. The blame rested squarely on his shoulders. They would have attended social gatherings as a couple long ago if he hadn't concealed his identity from her. His actions had isolated him at home while she navigated social engagements. Despite his mild resentment, Zachary watched his wife hop into Elisa's car and disappear. He was left standing alone. For a prolonged moment, Zachary lingered outside the bookshop before musing, It seems I've been left behind by my wife, Mrs. Lane. From her nearby vantage point, Mrs. Lane chimed in, Sir, everything the missus is doing is ultimately for you. You should take heart in that. Serenity had cultivated a close relationship with Mrs. Lane. Following Zachary's revelation of his identity, Sim had considered the matter and opted to let Mrs. Lane continue working for Serenity. I'm not bothered at all, Zachary acknowledged. Her background didn't affect his perception of Serenity. In his eyes, she was more than enough. So what if she hailed from a humble background? Everyone starts somewhere. Not everyone is born into affluence. However, the missus does care about it. She's striving to adapt and integrate into your world because she loves you. Your journey together is long and challenging. She's eager to stand by your side. We should fully support her. Navigating the intricacies of being a spouse in an affluent family was no small feat. The role came with its own set of pressures and responsibilities, especially as Mrs. York. The Mrs. was demonstrating her commitment to learning and growing for Mr. Zachary's sake. 
Her willingness to evolve for him indicated her deep affection. After all, who willingly transforms themselves for another if not out of love? I'm concerned she might struggle to acclimate. I don't want her asking for a divorce, citing our incompatibility. Mrs. Lane responded, have faith in both yourself and the Mrs. Sir. After a contemplative pause, Zachary concurred and added a hint of jest, if she ever wants to be rid of me, she can just kill me off. The only way she'll be single is if she becomes a widow. Mrs. Lane was momentarily rendered speechless. Thankfully, Serenity had already left, otherwise, Zachary's half-serious words could have provoked another quarrel. Zachary only departed with his security detail after arranging for John's car to be towed away by the traffic police. Back at the Stones' residence, Serenity finally donned a gown selected by her meticulous aunt. Audrey had taken personal care in choosing Serenity's attire. Serenity had assumed she could simply slip into any outfit. However, Audrey insisted on dressing according to the occasion. The event tonight catered to the upper middle class. Initially, Audrey had no intention of attending, but since Serenity requested her assistance, she saw it as an opportunity for Serenity to acclimate. Thus, she informed the host that she would be present to facilitate Serenity's entry into the circle. As this wasn't a gathering of the upper echelon, there was no need to be overly ostentatious. Audrey opted for a gown that wasn't overly extravagant. Serenity possessed a svelte figure and a striking countenance. Her graceful demeanor further enhanced her innate beauty, making any gown a suitable choice. Emerging in her selected gown, Serenity drew compliments from Audrey. Saren, you exude an air of refinement. The dress complements your figure beautifully. Just remember not to rush as you walk. Serenity was well versed in self-defense techniques. While her natural beauty was undeniable, her posture and movements held an air of authority. She walked briskly, a pace that few ladies could match. And Audrey, I could probably use these heels as weapons, Serenity remarked. Unused to high heels, she was comfortable in sneakers or flats. Kitten heels were the most she'd tolerate during social engagements with Jasmine and Mrs. Sox in higher society events. Stilettos were a rarity for her. I'll wholeheartedly support you if you decide to collaborate with Elisa on a project or business venture. Your pace doesn't concern me. However, tonight, you must carry yourself as a lady. Take your time. I could barely keep up when we were shopping the other day. Serenity blushed at the memory. Elisa had chosen killer stilettos for her for the evening. Daunted by their height and slimness, Serenity's apprehension bubbled to the surface. And Audrey, Elisa, I'm worried I won't be able to walk in these heels. They're so high and delicate. What if they break when I walk? Audrey was momentarily rendered speechless. Elisa responded with a grin, no one expects you to sprint in those heels. Serenity shot a glance at her aunt before gingerly sliding into the stilettos. She clutched Elisa's hand and took a few careful steps, her yearning for her house loafers palpable. Walk down the stairs and stroll around the front lawn in those heels. We can leave once you're comfortable, Audrey suggested, realizing she'd forgotten to have Serenity practice wearing the heels. Serenity stuck her tongue out, complying with Audrey's advice as she ventured out of the room. Elisa chimed in, I'll accompany you, Saren. Elisa's presence provided a touch of sympathy for Serenity. As the two made their way, Serenity gripped the banister and moved cautiously. Elisa shared a knowing smile, remarking, You brought this upon yourself. You could have asked anyone for help, but you chose to seek my mother's guidance. She's all about etiquette, she might as well work for the queen. If you don't meet her standards, she might suggest a fresh start. Serenity was left momentarily speechless. Who else could she turn to if not Aunt Audrey? 
If she were with Thackeray, he'd likely indulge her and be fine with her donning her loafers. Besides, the event is still hours away. You have plenty of time to practice, Elisa added with a grin. I'll be right here to support you. Serenity descended to the ground floor with cautious steps, wary of any slipperiness on the floor. Clive and Alice had just returned from outside. Alice, pregnant, had gone to her parents' house for dinner, and Clive had fetched her after work. Both of them were taken aback by Serenity's careful demeanor. Concerned, Alice inquired, Saren, is something bothering your legs? She approached Serenity, her expression full of care. Elisa chimed in with a laugh. Take a look at her shoes, Alice. She's not accustomed to wearing high heels, so mom advised her to walk around outside for a while to get more comfortable before we leave. Alice's gaze shifted from the stilettos on Serenity's feet to her face. She patted Serenity's shoulder and said with a smile, thinking of Mr. York should give you the strength to overcome anything. Serenity still had a long way to go. If she intended to fit into Zachary's social circle, hard work was a necessity. Clive also joined the conversation, stepping closer and glancing at his cousin's legs before choosing to remain silent. I'll head outside to practice walking, Serenity announced. Sure, but be careful. You're still in your gown. Don't stain it, Alice reminded her, her smile warm with concern. She worried that Serenity might slip or fall. Serenity proceeded with even greater caution, her steps slow and measured. Elisa accompanied her outside. As Serenity adjusted to the high heels, Elisa recorded a video and sent it to Zachary. Zachary accessed Serenity's social media when she was asleep, allowing her post to be visible to Elisa. Zachary could now receive the video sent by Elisa with a message, Zachary, Saren is putting in a lot of effort for you. I hope you'll never disappoint her or deceive her for the rest of your lives. Zachary's reply came promptly, all the love in my life is reserved solely for Serenity, Elisa stared at the message for a while but refrained from responding. She continued to accompany Serenity in the yard, helping her to walk more naturally. As they reached the gate, Elisa suddenly noticed several luxury cars parked at the neighboring large villa. The previous occupants had moved away over a decade ago, selling the villa to settle their debts. Elisa had hoped her mother would purchase the neighboring property and merge it with their own, but by the time they inquired, the villa had already been sold. Seeing the numerous luxury cars, Elisa assumed the new owner had arrived to inspect the property. With the sale complete, renovations and design changes were likely to follow. What's caught your attention, Elisa? Serenity leaned in, her curiosity piqued. That large villa was sold recently. I wanted to find out who bought it. Our family was considering purchasing it, but we were a step too late. Someone beat us to it. If they had that much money, why didn't they buy a new villa or acquire land to build one from scratch? Elisa's regret over not acquiring the neighboring villa was evident. Wilt Spoon is already fully developed. It's not easy to find suitable land to build a new villa, and the smaller villas in other neighborhoods don't compare to ones like the one you're living in. The area consisted solely of expansive villas, likely developed by wealthy individuals who seized the opportunity to secure prime plots of land during Wiltspoon's early stages of development. For affluent individuals who couldn't obtain a substantial parcel of land, Acquiring several smaller villas and then merging and renovating them into a larger villa was a common practice. Elisa fell into silence before responding, You're right. That explains why there was such a scramble when news spread that my neighbor was selling the villa. A group of people emerged from the villa, catching their attention. It's him. Elisa's keen eyes quickly identified the person stepping out, accompanied by a retinue of men in black attire, Remy. 
Serenity looked over and gradually recollected. Isn't that Mr. Johnson from Annenberg? He already has a house in Wiltspoon. Why did he buy another one? He even outpaced us to buy the villa at such a high price. He moved faster than we did, Elisa murmured, her frustration evident. Do you think he intends to settle down here in Wiltspoon? Serenity pondered aloud. Remy, who managed FC and Co's business in Wiltspoon, often returned to his residence in Annenberg. Although he possessed a villa in Wiltspoon, he hadn't acquired additional estate before this. However, this wasn't unusual. After all, he hailed from Annenberg and regularly returned to that city. Elisa's discontent stemmed from the fact that Remy had suddenly snapped up a sprawling villa spanning over an acre. Serenity chimed in, isn't it common for wealthy individuals like him to have numerous properties in their portfolio? My husband gave me a stack of keys and property deeds to manage. Having declined Zachary's offer to transfer all his properties into her name, Serenity hadn't kept track of the exact number of deeds. Regardless, the assortment of house keys on various keyrings had accumulated into a sizable mound. Elisa hesitated. You're right. As Remy exited the Grand Villa, preparing to enter his car and leave, one of his bodyguards whispered something to him. He pivoted and spotted Elisa and Serenity. After a brief pause, he approached the two women. Elisa opened the villa's door upon seeing Remy's approach and greeted him with a smile. We meet again, Mr. Johnson. Remy reciprocated the smile. Indeed, we do. He nodded in Serenity's direction, offering a polite greeting. Hello, Mrs. York. Mr. Johnson, Serenity replied with a nod. Elisa inquired, did you acquire that villa, Mr. Johnson? Remy replied confirming that he acquired the villa. You seem to be well informed. We've been neighbors with the Zimmers for over a decade, so we assumed we'd be among the first to know. Yet, when our family inquired about the villa, we were informed that it had already been sold. We were curious to find out who the buyer was, although we didn't anticipate it would be you. Remy chuckled. I purchased Zimmer Corporation after learning of Mr. Zimmer's decision to sell his villa to settle debts, I accompanied him to inspect the property and decided to buy it. Hearing your account now, I'm glad I acted swiftly. If I had hesitated, the villa might have slipped through my fingers and into yours. Elisa's grin widened. We're now neighbors. Do you plan on renovating the villa? Yes, I do. I'm not particularly fond of the current interior design, so I'll enlist a designer to create new layout plans. Elisa didn't expect Remy to plan on redecorating it. Remy explained, there's nothing wrong with refurbishing a newly purchased house. Remy's gaze lingered on Elisa as he spoke, purchasing a home is a significant decision and warrants careful consideration. Considering the substantial investment I made in acquiring the villa, it's essential that I tailor it to my preferences. Comfort will only come if I genuinely appreciate the design. Recalling that her family also enlisted a renowned interior designer to customize their villa to their liking, Elisa nodded understandingly. This resulted in years of contented living for her family. You're absolutely right. Since we're destined to be neighbors, why don't you join us for a cup of tea? Remy accepted Elisa's invitation without hesitation and followed them into the house. In the living hall, Clive and his wife were seated on the sofa. Audrey was present, engaged in conversation with her daughter-in-law. Upon hearing the unfamiliar voice, they all turned their attention to the door, where Elisa and Serenity were ushering in a young man. Seeing Remy, Clive stood and approached with a friendly smile. The wind must be quite robust today to have blown you all the way here, Mr. Johnson, Remy chuckled in response. Indeed, only the strongest winds could carry me. 
Audrey, though having heard of Remy, had previously only seen him from a distance. It was only when Clive addressed him that she recognized him. Hello, Mrs. Stone, Remy greeted Audrey with courtesy as he was invited to take a seat. Audrey returned his smile and encouraged him to sit. No need to apologize, dear. Elisa chimed in, Mr. Johnson has purchased the Zimmer Villa. He'll be our new neighbor. Audrey and Clive were taken aback by this revelation. Clive smiled and remarked, so it was you, Mr. Johnson. Your information sources are quite efficient. Knowing that FC and Co's assistant was akin to Josh, highly skilled in gathering information. Clive sensed that Remy, like Josh, would be an ideal candidate to join the Houston family, mirroring the dynamics of the Buchan family. I acquired Mr. Zimmer's company, Remy clarified. Clive's realization dawned. Remy's swiftness in securing the property was due to his purchase of the Zimmer company itself. As the conversation continued, pastries and tea were served. Remy politely sampled the tea but refrained from touching the pastries, mirroring Zachary's aversion to sweets. Noticing Remy's inclination, Serenity discerned his distaste for sugary treats. Remy's visit was brief. He had merely stopped in to greet the family, considering their impending status as neighbors. Politely declining the Stone's offer to stay for dinner, he rose to leave. Elisa proactively accompanied him to the door to bid him farewell. Mom, Clive, have you noticed that Elisa and Mr. Johnson seem acquainted? Alice chimed in, sharing her observations after some careful listening. Alice had been quietly observing the interactions. Knowing Elisa's usual proud and selective demeanor toward men, it surprised Alice to see her treating a man who wasn't Zachary so well. Serenity elaborated, Elisa and Mr. Johnson have met a few times before. Their first encounter was on the road. She was blocking his way, but he yielded out of courtesy. Audrey interjected thoughtfully, Mr. Johnson is truly remarkable. The men from his family are on par with the York families. It's just that they reside so far away. A contemplative silence fell upon the room. Serenity briefly entertained the thought of a potential romantic connection between Elisa and Remy. Then she remembered the geographical barrier, Remy lived in Annenberg, a significant distance from their home. Audrey, having only one daughter, wouldn't easily agree to a marriage that would take Elisa far away. Serenity ceased dwelling on the idea. If Elisa and Remy's relationship blossomed, they would navigate those challenges themselves. In comparison to the complexity she and Zachary were dealing with, Elisa and Remy's issues seemed minor. With Remy's departure, Elisa returned to her house and promptly informed her mother, Mom, Saren is comfortable walking now. Let's go. Audrey verified Serenity's progress by having her walk a few steps before rising from her seat. Alice, holding a dainty clutch, presented it to her mother-in-law. Rest well at home, Alice. Though you're still in the early stages of pregnancy and your mobility isn't compromised yet, take care. Now, I'll take Elisa and Saren along, Audrey advised with concern. I'll be careful, Mom. Don't worry Clive is here. Enjoy yourselves, Alice conveyed. A wink directed at Serenity and Elisa, though her demeanor shifted to a gentle one when Audrey turned her way. With Clive accompanying her, she escorted the two ladies to the door. The evening's event was hosted by the Dowlings, in honor of their eldest daughter's 18th birthday. The family was throwing a grand birthday banquet. During the journey, Audrey quizzed Serenity about the Dowling family, finding satisfaction in Serenity's impeccable recall. Saren, your memory surpasses Elisa's. She seems to forget anyone she encounters. That's because I don't find it worth the effort to remember. Why bother remembering people I don't get along with? Elisa retorted. Audrey playfully tapped her daughter's forehead. 
Exactly. You won't find a husband if you don't work on that temper of yours. Elisa countered with a grin, if I don't marry, I'll stay with you and dad forever. Serenity chuckled, chiming in, Elisa's fine just the way she is. I appreciate her genuine character. Elisa's confident demeanor spared her the need for pretense or flattery. Her natural self-assuredness meant she didn't have to strive for others' approval. You too, Audrey sighed with a mix of exasperation and fondness. She was content that her daughter and niece shared an amicable relationship. Aunt Audrey, I'll be returning home this weekend, Serenity shared. Audrey didn't cry but simply responded, wait for me. I'll accompany you, along with your uncle Daryl. Alright. Zachary and I will probably set off after breakfast. I intend to load up on bricks and gravel and make the journey to bring them back tomorrow. I'll tell them it's for renovating or rebuilding my parents' house. Audrey was astute enough to understand that Serenity was launching a formal campaign to claim her parents' inheritance. This was just the start of Serenity's battle for what rightfully belonged to her family. It was acceptable for old Mr. and Mrs. Hunt to reside in Serenity and Liberty's house. However, their intention was to bestow the inherited property to John, left to Serenity and her sister by their parents, which led the sisters to initiate legal action by taking the matter to court. The house in question had been erected by Serenity and Liberty's parents, and the land deed bore their father's name. According to the rules of inheritance, John held no rightful claim to the house. Moreover, both sisters were alive and well. Audrey inquired with genuine concern, do you know where to purchase bricks and gravel? During my last visit, I got in touch with Ms. Deli. She informed me. Her family had their house rebuilt last year, so she provided the contact details of a brick contractor. I can arrange to have a truckload of bricks delivered this weekend, Serenity responded with determination. Serenity had long harbored the desire to reclaim her parents' house. In the past, the circumstances hadn't permitted it, but now, equipped with the means, she and her sister were ready to take action. Initially, they had imagined that if their grandparents wished to reside in the house until their passing, they could do so. Then, once their grandparents had moved on, the sisters would rightfully assume possession, passing it down through their own generations. However, their innocence was swiftly dispelled. When their grandparents ousted them, they had already set the wheels in motion to take over the house, ensuring it would remain within their direct lineage. That year, old Mr. Hunt expelled the sisters, bellowing, your father was my son. With his passing, it's only fitting that his legacy belongs to me, his father. This is his final display of respect. Had the sisters been sons, he might have tolerated the hardship of raising them, ensuring they inherited their father's property. However, since they were daughters, the thought of them inheriting his son's house was unthinkable. In his eyes, daughters held no stake in family assets. Scott had sired only two daughters, no sons. In his view, the house should be passed to his nephew for inheritance. This way, it would remain within the Hunt family rather than be claimed by others. Serenity recalled her grandfather's words vividly. Go take your in-law's estate if you're capable. The Hunt property is none of your concern. Unwritten norms in rural areas often dictated that houses were bequeathed to sons. If families were prosperous and cared for their daughters, they might purchase a separate dwelling for them. Families without sons either married a son-in-law into the family or bequeathed the property to a nephew. In the past, houses from families without sons were typically handed to nephews. Even in the absence of sons, daughters could rightfully inherit the family estate. Yet, those attached to traditional customs continued to heed the voice of the older generation, favoring nephews. Serenity deemed these antiquated views illogical. If parents couldn't rely on their own daughters, 
How could they place faith in nephews? These nephews had parents, wives, and children of their own, struggling to support their own families. Their capacity to care for their uncles was doubtful. The sisters were resolutely heading back to stake their claim on their parents' legacy, simultaneously challenging these antiquated beliefs and advocating for all daughters in similar circumstances. Audrey expressed her approval, All right, if everything is set, feel free to reach out if you need further assistance. With Zachary by your side, I'm not worried. Upon mentioning Zachary, Serenity couldn't resist sending him a message to inquire about his activities. He swiftly replied, I miss you. Serenity found herself momentarily speechless, a smile breaking through though she restrained any audible laughter. We're en route to the Dowling's residence now, she informed him. Zachary, this late? Were you able to manage the stilettos? Serenity was taken aback and inquired, how did you know I was wearing stilettos? She had worn flats when she left. Zachary candidly responded, Elisa took a video of your stiletto walk and sent it to me. I appreciate your efforts, Saren. You're truly putting in the effort. Thank you for embracing the idea of fitting into my world for my sake, Serenity generally easygoing and inclined towards comfort in dressing, was undergoing a transformation for him. The challenges she faced for his sake tugged at his heartstrings, and he cherished her for it. He pledged to shower her with affection throughout their lives. Serenity, so Elisa betrayed me. I must have looked hilarious trying to walk in heels. I can't help but want to toss them aside. Sandals are infinitely more comfortable. In Wiltspoon, it was customary for people to saunter around in sandals. We encountered Mr. Johnson and invited him to join us for a while. This delayed our departure, Serenity responded to her husband's previous query. Zachary was somewhat taken aback and asked, How did you come across Mr. Johnson? Serenity, he acquired the expansive villa adjacent to Aunt Audrey's residence. We happened upon him while he was consulting with an interior designer for the house. Elisa extended an invitation for tea, considering they'll be neighbors in the future, the couple exchanged messages, so Serenity bravely conveyed her speculation. Zachary, I believe Mr. Johnson purchased Zimmer's villa to be in proximity to Elisa. When she was at the hospital for an intravenous drip due to her injured hand and Elisa accompanied her, Remy was also present, nursing a stomach ailment. Although Remy had been nursing his stomach tenderly, the moment he laid eyes on Elisa, he straightened up immediately, raising his head and feigning wellness. This pretense was rooted in his reluctance for Elisa to witness him in a feeble state. His concern for her perception of him was evident. Back then, Serenity had discerned Remy's interest in Elisa. Yet, considering Elisa had just relinquished her feelings for Zachary, Serenity refrained from probing and merely observed from the sidelines. Now, with Remy acquiring the Zimmer's villa and becoming the Stone's neighbor, Serenity couldn't help but theorize that this decision was a step towards the future. Proximity could potentially foster even deeper connections, Zachary wasn't particularly concerned about who Elisa ended up with as long as she ceased her pestering. He responded to his beloved wife, Remy is a fine individual. Saren, who are you texting? Your phone seems to be buzzing incessantly. Elisa leaned over suddenly, prompting Serenity to quickly respond, Oh, nothing important. Just chatting with Zachary asking about his activities. Elisa sat back up, hearing that Serenity was messaging Zachary, and playfully commented. You two just reconciled, and you're already flaunting your affection in front of us. If you keep up with this lovey-dovey act, you'll make us envious. Audrey and Serenity simultaneously chimed in, if envy strikes, then hurry up and find yourself a boyfriend. 
Elisa was momentarily at a loss for words, momentarily forgetting that her mother was also present in the car. Upon their arrival at the Dowling's residence, the entrance to the villa stood open, revealing a splendidly adorned front lawn. Numerous guests, each holding tall glasses, engaged in lively conversations in clusters. Audrey's status commanded swift notice from the Dowling family the moment her car pulled up before the villa. Mr. and Mrs. Dowling, accompanied by their children, promptly approached to offer their greetings. As the car found its designated spot, Mr. Dowling, joined by his wife and kids, stepped forward. With a genial smile, he personally opened the car door for Audrey and greeted, Mrs. Stone. Audrey disembarked with an air of grace. Mr. Dowling, she responded with an equally amiable smile. Mrs. Dowling, accompanied by her son and daughters, extended her salutations to Audrey. The Dowling family consisted of two daughters and a son. The youngest was their eight-year-old son, yet exuding courtesy as he politely greeted Audrey according to his mother's instruction. Elisa and Serenity alighted from the car, flanking Audrey on either side like a pair of sisters. Elisa was renowned in Wiltspoon's high society not just for her temperament but also for being the sole individual audacious enough to openly confess her affection for Zachary and pursue him. Indeed, Zachary had his share of admirers, yet none possessed the same courage as Elisa. Miss Stone, you seem to become more stunning with each encounter, Mrs. Dowling complimented Elisa. Praising Elisa held the same significance as pleasing Audrey. Audrey's smile brightened. Your two daughters are equally charming, Mrs. Dowling. They've inherited the best traits from both you and your husband. I still recall my last interaction with your elder daughter. She was a little girl with pigtails back then. In the blink of an eye, she has transformed into a young lady. You are truly blessed, Mrs. Dowling. Maya, the Dowling's eldest daughter, blushed modestly at the flattering comment. Mrs. Stone, who is this? She looks familiar. Mrs. Dowling directed her gaze towards Serenity, sensing a familiarity but struggling to recall the context. Audrey introduced Serenity, this is my niece, Serenity Hunt. Due to an urgent matter, she was away from Wiltspoon during the last gathering my family hosted, so I couldn't introduce her to everyone. Serenity Hunt. Both Mr. and Mrs. Dowling were taken aback. It was the York family's Mrs. After Zachary's high-profile interview, the name Serenity Hunt had become a household name in Wiltspoon. Her photo hadn't been widely circulated, leaving people without a visual association. Attempts to locate the viral news from a while ago yielded no fruitful results, as the images had been taken down. Moreover, the images circulating then were from over a decade ago when Serenity was still a child. Maturation had altered her appearance significantly. Mrs. York, meeting you is an honor. A beaming smile adorned Mr. Dowling's face as he extended his right hand, seeking a handshake with Serenity. My apologies for intruding, Mr. Dowling. I don't have any invitation but I tagged along with my Aunt Audrey, Serenity clarified. A warm smile graced Mrs. Dowling's lips. Nonsense, you are not intruding at all. It's an honor to have you here, Mrs. York, she replied, radiating graciousness. Serenity held a birthday gift that Audrey thoughtfully prepared for Maya. Passing the gift to Audrey, who then presented it to Maya, Serenity addressed her with a smile, Happy birthday, Ms. Dowling. Quickly, Mrs. Dowling interjected, Just call her Maya, Mrs. Stone. We're delighted that you graced Maya's birthday celebration with your presence. Bringing a gift was not necessary. She gestured for her daughter to accept the offering. The gift unveiled itself as a charming set of jewelry. Gratefully, Maya accepted the birthday present and conveyed her thanks to Audrey. 
Since Audrey had attended with only her daughter and niece, Mr. Dowling saw to the entertainment of other guests, while his wife and daughters accompanied their esteemed visitors. Warmly, Mrs. Dowling welcomed Audrey and the two cousins into their home. Observers noticed that her enthusiasm was infused with deep respect. Interestingly, Mrs. Dowling seemed particularly deferential to a young woman standing beside Audrey. While few questioned Serenity's suitability for Zachary, Mrs. Dowling held a distinct perspective. Regardless of anyone's opinion, Serenity was undeniably Zachary's lawful wife and the York family's mistress. Zachary's revelation of Serenity's status was a testament to his affection for her. Her place as Mrs. York was as steadfast as a mountain, backed by the open-minded reputation of the York family elders. In light of old Mrs. York's selection of Serenity, no one dared disrespect her, even if she were a beggar. Given this, Mrs. Dowling neither underestimated nor disrespected Serenity. As the future head of the York family and the esteemed wife of Zachary, she was, by all accounts, the most venerable woman in Wilspoon. Recognizing the age gap between them, Mrs. Dowling didn't seek friendship with Serenity, instead, she aimed to leave a favorable impression. Moreover, Serenity's presence at her daughter's birthday gathering was advantageous. The prestige earned from the York family's attendance would cast a long-reaching positive impact on the Dowlings. As the women exited the house, intrigued murmurs circulated among the attendees. Curious gazes turned to the older woman, Mrs. Newman, who was familiar with the social circle. Mrs. Newman, do you happen to know the identity of the woman standing beside Mrs. Stone? Did Mrs. Dowling introduce her inside? In a community where everyone knew one another, Serenity's newcomer status sparked interest. Casually, Mrs. Newman responded, she's merely a provincial newcomer. Does she believe she can ascend the social hierarchy and join the elite? The crowd fell into a contemplative silence. Mrs. Newman's youngest daughter, with a trace of disdain in her tone, spoke up, she's Serenity Hunt. The collective gasp echoed, the York family's Mrs. Remaining composed, Mrs. Newman exhibited a touch of derision. As I said, she's just a provincial newcomer who managed to luck her way into marriage with the York family. Mr. York didn't even host a wedding banquet for her. Who knows what maneuvers she employed to secure her position? The bystander sensed a tinge of envy coloring Mrs. Newman's words. Undaunted by others' opinions, Mrs. Newman pressed on, her tone critical. Mrs. Stone and Ms. Stone display remarkable magnanimity. Even though their chosen son-in-law was swept away by a niece, Mrs. Stone can still introduce serenity to everyone. Mrs. Newman doubted whether she could manage such grace. After all, no matter the closeness, a niece could never equate to a daughter. Her remarks provoked a reproach from another attendee. Your choice of words should be cautious, Mrs. Newman. It's important to note that Mr. York never reciprocated Miss Stone's sentiments nor made any promises. It was Miss Stone's own wishful thinking. However, it is true that Miss Stone is indeed magnanimous. She relinquished her feelings for Mr. York upon learning of his marriage. She even extended her blessings to the couple. Such actions have reshaped my perception of her. The rebuker added a stern warning, feel free to discuss this here but avoid spreading talks about Mrs. York's identity elsewhere. Mr. York is not someone your family should provoke. Mrs. Newman hesitated, her retort stifled as she succumbed to the pressure. Mrs. Newman was a topic of gossip within the circle due to her marriage to her late husband's younger brother. That led her to become the eldest Mrs. of the Newman family after remarrying. Her previous husband's suicide left their daughter Cameron in her care. Yet, Cameron lived in obscurity within the Newman family, enduring mistreatment. An illness had left her blind at 16, exacerbating her challenges. 
Cameron had to forge a living by running a flower shop, her meager earnings strained by her half-sister's disruptions. Unbeknownst to Serenity, Mrs. Newman harbored bias against her. Guided by her aunt, Serenity engaged with various women. Those with families were more welcoming, while a few looked down upon her, none dared to voice their opinions in Audrey's presence. Nevertheless, Serenity noticed the disdain, though mostly manifested as cold indifference. Elisa grew weary of the social dynamics and pulled Serenity outside to explore the yard, the liveliest area. Elisa's reputation for arrogance and condescension preceded her, deterring anyone from approaching. Seated on chairs at the yard's edge, away from the crowd but able to observe their interactions, Elisa turned her wine glass and addressed Serenity. How are you feeling, Saren? The question accompanied a slight tilt of her head. Relaxing into her chair, Serenity offered a carefree smile. I'm fine. I exchanged pleasantries with the friendly ones and ignored those who disdain me. While I may be new to this social sphere, it's not my first encounter with such scenarios. I may know many of these women, but they remain unfamiliar to me. I've witnessed their behavior before, allowing me to discern their true nature. After being indoors for half an hour, all I got was a name card, Elisa chuckled. Seems about right. People are generally after their own interests. Why would they care about you if there's nothing for them to gain? What kind of food do you want? I can fetch it for you. Earlier, I saw some delicate pastries. They looked quite tempting. Grab a few of those for me please, Serenity replied with a sweet tooth, eager to try the exquisite treats. Back in the day, when she accompanied Jasmine to events, she and Jasmine would often hide away to indulge in food and drink. Pastries were always her favorite, surpassing those found in stores. Sure thing. Elisa placed her wine glass on the small table before her and got up to gather food. Upon her return, she was accompanied by two maids in the employ of the Dowlings. The maids held trays laden with the snacks Elisa had chosen for Serenity and herself. Leave them here, thank you. The maids set down the trays and left to attend to others. Serenity and Elisa nestled in a corner, savoring their snacks and drinks. No one dared disturb them, not just because of Elisa's irritable disposition, but also due to the inopportune nature of such an occurrence. Saren, Elisa suddenly nudged Serenity and pointed towards another corner. A girl discreetly retrieved something from her purse and poured it into her wine glass before returning to the crowd as though nothing happened. Oblivious to their observation, she remained unaware of their scrutiny. What did she put in the drink? Elisa speculated, probably some sort of drug. It will dissolve in the wine, masked by the wine's flavor, so the drinker won't detect any tampering. I wonder who her target is. It's quite audacious to do something like this at Ms. Dowling's birthday party, aiming to incur the Dowling's wrath. I believe we crossed paths with her when we arrived. Isn't her surname Newman? Serenity recalled. I don't really remember. I hardly bother with people like her. The only reason I'm here tonight is to keep you company. If it weren't for that, neither my mom nor I would have shown up. Elisa's presence tonight was solely for Serenity's sake. Serenity chuckled. I'll craft you some miniature animals when I have the time. What kinds of animals would you like? I want all 12 zodiac signs. Sure thing. Give me some time, and I'll send them your way once I'm done. Just remember not to flaunt them. Zachary can be a little envious. Zachary was known for his occasional bouts of jealousy. Elisa laughed. Be content with what you have. You don't know how many people wish they could experience his domineering side. True, true. 
I'm satisfied with what I have now. I wonder who Ms. Newman intends to offer that glass of wine to. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe to my YouTube channels, The Voice Channel and watch my original creations, as well as my new channel La Novella de Vos showcasing the forbidden love story. Please don't forget to hit all from the notification bell, so you will get notified whenever a new video is uploaded. Thank you.